Section 1 of The History Teacher's Magazine, Volume 1, Number 3, November 1909. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marianne Spiegel. The History Teacher's Magazine, Volume 1, Number 3, November 1909. Section 1 Wall Maps for History Classes. There are few persons who will question the importance of a liberal use of good maps as a supplement to and even a part of the teaching of history in high schools and colleges, and there are few teachers who are not perplexed by the difficulties in the selection and use of these essential aids to the teaching of their subject. Owing to the considerable cost of this kind of apparatus, there is bound to be the ever-present financial difficulty. Owing to the great number of publications purporting to meet the needs of the history teacher, from small outlined maps costing less than a cent apiece to elaborate atlases costing fifty dollars, there is a great range of choice within which there is no little difficulty in deciding just what cartographical aids are best for the problem at hand. As the financial question is always dependent upon local and particular considerations, and as the actual handling of maps is a subject in itself large enough for a separate article, I will limit myself to the matter of the selection of the best maps. It is assumed, of course, that a selection has to be made. There are few institutions wealthy enough to buy indiscriminately everything offered for sale, and even were that generally true, an indiscriminate use of good and bad materials could not be countenanced anyway. The question is, then, what are the most useful maps that may be made available for schools with but limited means at their disposal? The great merit of a wall map consists in its size, which makes possible the depicting on a large scale of things which can be represented upon a map, with the further capital advantage that such a map can be seen by a great many people at the same time. Its superiority over the atlas lies, then, not in accuracy or wealth of detail, but in its visibility. For this there is absolutely no substitute, and this advantage, which for the teacher is almost the only one, secures for the wall map a place among the indispensables in classroom equipment. They can be made to represent anything that a map can, though their special province is the exhibition of general facts where minute details are negligible. In fact, the encumbering of a large map with a multitude of names and other data is the cardinal sin of the cartographer. The two broad classes of facts put upon maps are political and physical, and almost always in combination, as neither one has very much meaning without the other. Let us take up the physical maps first, as they offer the greatest difficulties, are the most expensive, and in consequence are most rarely found of a satisfactory character. The trouble with a physical map is that it has the impossible task of showing physical features as they are, and so that they can be seen, this is impossible, because if things are shown in their right proportions, and if such natural features as rivers and mountains are drawn true to scale, they would appear in most cases as nothing more than faint lines and specks upon the map. As it is absolutely necessary that they be seen clearly at some distance, a gross exaggeration of their apparent size is made necessary. These difficulties are successfully compromised in a series well known in the United States, published by the House of Perthes, and known as the Seidau Habernicht series. In their color scheme, omission of unnecessary details in general mechanical excellence, they are so satisfactory that they have come to be something like the standard maps for the continents. Their great English competitor is Stanford's new series of orographical school maps, compiled under the direction of the well-known writer H. J. Mackinder. Of an equally high character and worked out with somewhat greater elaboration of details are some of the maps of W. and A. K. Johnston, and the series of physical maps published in America by the Rand McNally Company. Before leaving the subject of physical wall maps, I want to say a word of commendation of the maps of Dietrich Reimer of Berlin, prepared by Richard Kiepert. The classical maps of Henry Kiepert, published by the same house, are seen in nearly every high school in the country, but the work of Richard Kiepert is altogether too little known. Owing to the influence of mere personal taste, one should be very cautious about stating their preferences too confidently while attempting to discriminate between a number of different types of maps, all of which are excellent. But I feel bound to state that I regard Richard Kiepert's map of Central Europe as representing the great desideratum of map-making. 
the essential physiographic features of that most intricate region including the primary and secondary axes of the continent are exhibited with such clearness that it is possible to use this map before a large class in a college or university lecture course for all ordinary purposes of the high school the sidow habernick map of europe is sufficient and as it is the map of the whole continent the geographical relationships of europe and africa and europe and asia are shown as of course they cannot be with the keepert map but no college class should be denied the privilege of seeing the keepert map or its equivalent and if there is an equivalent i am not acquainted with it some of the maps of the french houses of delagrave and hatcheret and company are deserving of wider use in this country but our dependence on english and german publications for commercial reasons is not likely to be diminished for several years to come these french firms apparently make little effort to advertise their wares in the united states so that the difficulty of keeping track of their latest works and ordering them when they are known constitutes a serious obstacle to their general use the second grand division of wall maps is made up of those which attempt primarily to show forth political divisions they fall naturally into two further divisions first political maps of modern countries as they are at the present time and second historical maps which represent political divisions of the earth as they were at different times in the past the most accurate maps of the first class are generally speaking published by the various governments of the civilized world particularly of those military nations whose general staffs have from the necessities of scientific warfare been driven to preparing as accurate representations of the surface of the earth as is humanly possible of course such maps record the minutest topographical details and to that extent are physical in character but for that matter purely political maps in the sense of totally ignoring all physical features and becoming happily almost unknown all a political map is then is a map which pays relatively more attention to the human side of geography than to the physical and so as it were looks at the face of the continent from the point of view of man rather than nature there are good maps of the first subdivision almost without number and they are well known by people other than specialists those published in england and america by such houses as rand mcdally w and a k johnston george philip and son and edward stanford may serve as good examples they are quite adequate for the english-speaking world and are known to schoolmen throughout the country the subject of historical maps the second subdivision in the classification made above cannot be dismissed quite so easily and the treatment of this topic should not be relegated to the end of a short article on maps in general in this field of cartography england and america are distinctly behind the peoples of the continent of europe so that for maps illustrating historical geography recourse must be had to foreign publications particularly those of germany without any attempt to make comparisons i must content myself with the bare statement that the two series henry keepert for the ancient period and spruner brettschneider for the medieval and modern period cover the field of european and oriental history very satisfactorily for college classes the fact that in the first series all names are in latin and in the second all names are in german make these maps unsatisfactory for general use in the high schools in lieu of these products of the firms reimer in berlin and perthes in gotha they are used very generally and with satisfaction the cheaper and cruder historical charts of mccown the color scheme in these charts is distinctive if not beautiful while the few minor inaccuracies are too unimportant to affect the general usefulness of the series there is no space left for even touching upon the subject of economic commercial and ethnographic maps upon the arrangement suspension and classification of the map collection in any given school or department of a university or upon the all-important topic of atlases a whole subject in itself closely related to the subject of wall maps and even more difficult to handle properly but these and other matters such as the actual handling of maps before classes and the treatment of the geographical factors in history though closely associated with the subject of wall maps are not within the scope of this article i shall be content if the references given here to particular maps prove specific enough to give practical aid to the history teacher in building up the map equipment of his department end of section one Section 2 of The History Teacher's Magazine, Volume 1, Number 3, November 1909. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Giordano. The History Teacher's Magazine, Volume 1, Number 3, November 1909, Section 2 the american historical association eighteen eighty four to nineteen o nine review of dr jameson's recent article a noteworthy article upon the origin of the american historical association and its history during the past twenty-five years appears in the october number of quote, the american historical review end quote. the author dr j franklin jameson is better fitted than any other man in the country to treat this subject and he gives us the early history of the association with a genial sympathy that enlists one's interest at once prefacing his remarks with the statement that quote, no agency has been so potent in the advancement of american historical scholarship end quote, as the association Dr. Jameson points out the conditions of historical research and pedagogy in the year 1884, in which the association was founded. There was but one general historical journal. In all the universities and colleges of the country, there were apparently only 15 professors and five assistant professors who gave all their time to history. The subject was in many ways subordinated or annexed to other topics including political science english literature geology german and french yet despite the small numbers of those engaged in teaching history dr jameson points out there were giants in those days men who were trained when the german system of history teaching was at its best or who like the great national literary historians had advanced far in their labors the specific details of the organization of the association at saratoga september tenth eighteen eighty four will be of much interest to the younger history workers with kindliness for diverging views dr jameson shows how early in the life of the association problems arose the successful settlement of which had much to do with the future of the organization should the association be a small one made up of forty or more Quote, immortals end quote. or should the appeal be made to a wider constituency and all interested in history be invited to join should the association accept incorporation by the nation and government aid it in its work should the meetings be held continuously in washington should the annual meetings with the papers read at such meetings be the sole form of activity entered into by the association the solution of these and other questions dr jameson points out giving credit and passing to the past and present workers in the association he names particularly as steps in advancing the gaining of a charter from the national government and incidentally the placing of the papers of the association in the hands of the government for publication taking the year eighteen ninety five as a critical point he shows that the association had eight thousand dollars in its treasury and current expenses of not over forty per cent of its income and that its work did not seem to prosper from that year however the adoption of a new policy broadened the activities of the association the support of the association was given to quote, the american historical review end quote. the american society of church history was affiliated with the main organization a committee of seven on the teaching of history in secondary schools was appointed and several years afterwards made its famous report later activities have been added from time to time a standing committee on bibliography the historical manuscripts commission the public archives commission the establishment of prizes for original work in history the start of the publication of a series of volumes of quote, original narratives of early american history end quote. the formation of a pacific coast branch the appointment of a committee of eight on the teaching of history in elementary schools which has but lately reported and the cooperation with a british committee to prepare a select bibliography of modern english history while the field of activities of the association has thus expanded 
the membership of the association has grown till now it stands at about twenty five hundred its funds amount to twenty six thousand dollars it has a revenue of eight thousand dollars a year and the government prints for it material which represents an outlay for printing of about seven thousand dollars dr jameson closes his article with the statement quote, probably no historical society in the world is more numerous it might perhaps be successfully maintained that none is more extensively useful if the quality of all that it does is not yet of ideal excellence it may be that its work is done as well as can be expected from an organization no member of which can give to its concerns more than a minor portion of his time at all events it has played an effective part in the historical progress of the last twenty-five years and none of those who took part in its foundation at saratoga in that now remote september need feel regret at his share in the transaction that it may flourish abundantly in the future must be the wish of all who care for the interests of american history and of history in america End quote. End of section two recording by greg giordano newport ritchie florida Section 3 of the History Teachers Magazine, Volume 1, Number 3, November 1909. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The History Teachers Magazine, Volume 1, Number 3, November 1909. Section 3. The Use of Sources in Instruction in Government and Politics. By Charles A. Beard adjunct professor of politics in Columbus University. What Dr. Stubbs said many years ago about the difficulty of mastering the history of institutions applies with equal force to the mastery of present institutions, especially in actual operation. Perhaps, in a way, the student of government is more fortunately situated than the student of history, for he can use the laboratory method to some extent. He may attend primaries and caucuses, visit the state capitol or the city hall, take a place among the spectators in a police court watching the daily grind, or observe the selectman, perhaps a drug clerk, superintend the construction of a town highway. But in the classroom, instruction in government and politics must perforce deal largely with abstractions. The historians, long ago recognizing the vice of unreality which attended them like a ghost that would not be downed, cast about for some new method that would give more firmness and life to their instruction. In their search, they came upon the sources, and instead of listening always to the voice of Green or Stubbs, they stopped to hear the voices of the kings, monks, warriors, and lawyers who helped make the history of which Green and Stubbs wrote. The result, as all the world knows, has been marvelous. It has brought more vividness and solidity to historical instruction. It has done more. The very method itself, in the hands of skilled workers, has become a discipline of the highest value. Whoever doubts it should read Professor Fling's article in the first issue of this magazine. Lawyers likewise have discovered the same difficulties which the teachers of history encountered, and, flinging away Blackstone in the textbooks, they have sought refuge in the sources alone. Perhaps they have gone too far with the case system. In fact, a reaction seems imminent at this moment, but the commentators will never recover their former sway. Strange to say, teachers of government and politics have not yet made any widespread use of the methods that have been found so effective in the hands of other students of institutions, and yet in quantity, variety, and interest, the sources available for their work are practically unlimited. One of the most important groups of materials, the government publications, can be had for the asking, and our wastebaskets are filled with the examples of another group, the fugitive literature of party politics. Acres of diamonds have been at our door, but our instruction in government and politics wears, in general, such a barren aspect that keen-sighted students are aware of its unreality and slow-switted ones find no delight or profit in it. No word in our curriculum suggests such innocuous futility as civics, and yet we are preparing citizens for service in a democracy. 
But to turn from preachments to some practical advice, which, I take it, is what the editor wanted when he asked me to do this article. The source materials for government and politics fall readily into four groups. 1. There are, first, the autobiographies, memoirs, and writings of statesmen, lawyers, legislators, judges, street-cleaning commissioners, police superintendents, and other persons who have actually conducted some branch of our government. These books, it is true, are often written to glorify the authors, but the solemn presentation of the unvarnished truth was not always the purpose of the medieval monk whose chronicle is studied with such zeal as a source. What could be more charming or illuminating than Senator Hoare's memoirs, Sherman's recollections, Blaine's story of his service in Congress, or Benton's view of things? Were there space at my disposal, I could fill this magazine with the topics on which I have secured informing notes from Hoare's work. There are wit and humor and reality on almost every page. I suspect, and whisper it here under breath, that a student who reads it will know more about the federal government than one who devotes his time to memorizing the sacred constitution, so prayerfully drafted by the fathers. 2. In the second group, I would place the government publications, state and federal and municipal. Now I am aware that this calls up in the minds of many readers visions of the long rows of repulsive volumes which cumber our library shelves and I know that government reports all look alike to careless observers. They are not, however. Even the congressional record has pages glistening with information on the inner workings of Congress and the play of interests in lawmaking. It takes some courage for the busy teacher to start on that formidable monument to the capacity of the government printing office. But, as Professor Reinch has pointed out in the preface to his splendid collection of materials on the federal government, the process of studying the sources, while irksome at the beginning, soon has the exhilarating effect on the mind that brisk physical exercise has on the body. Only one who has turned from a vest pocket manual of pre-digested civics to the apparently cold and barren waste of the congressional record can know the exhilaration of the experiment. In the debates of the conventions in which our state constitutions are framed, we can find materials which will illuminate every part of our commonwealth government. Then there are the executive messages and inaugurals, voluminous and forbidding, but even a few hours over them with pen in hand and a plentiful supply of page markers will yield fruit never dreamed of by the teacher who has exhausted his ingenuity on inventing a table that will show graphically what powers are coordinate, exclusive, and reserved in our constitutional system. Then there are the departmental reports. I have a shelf full for the years 1908-09, to just in front of my working table. They give a lot of precise information on the state of the civil service, the organization of the army and navy, the work of the Bureau of Corporations, the investigations of the Department of Labor, and the like, which I must have to give correctness and precision to my instruction in matters of state and federal administration. Then they are indispensable for reference. I am constantly having trouble in remembering whether the Pension Bureau is a bureau or a division, or is in the War Department, where it would seem to belong, or in the Department of Commerce and Labor, or somewhere else. It really does not matter so much, for doubtless most of our best citizens do not know where it is, especially since under our system of indirect taxation they don't feel its hands in their pockets. Finally, there are Supreme Court decisions. Here, laymen must beware for the lawyers have forbidden us to come in. Only one who has mastered the mysteries of real property and torts, so they would have us believe, can understand the mysteries of direct taxation as defined by the Supreme Court of the United States. Now we must not take the lawyers too seriously, but we must master the elements of law and also learn how to get the point of a case. Discover the facts and separate the necessary reasoning from the obiter. Certainly no student of American government has any business teaching the subject unless he has read and understood many of the greatest decisions of the august tribunal that presides over our political destinies. 3. A third group of materials embraces state and federal laws. How many readers of this article have ever seen in one spot the yearly output of his state legislature or Congress? How many readers who have discussed congressional appropriations 
have ever seen an appropriation bill or part of one? How many readers who have discussed tariff and finance have ever seen a real live tariff bill reposing in the pages of the statutes of the United States? I always take Ash's edition of the Charter of New York City, a portly volume of about a thousand pages, into my classroom and perform before the eyes of the students the experiment of running through the chief titles. It helps to keep them modest in their estimate of their knowledge of our city government, and it is a standing apology for the innumerable question which I failed to answer. I may mention also in leaving this group the state election law which can be secured readily from the Secretary of the Commonwealth and should be always in hand. 4. The fourth group includes the literature of current and party politics, vast, fugitive, here today and gone tomorrow, but of an importance never imagined by students who have staked their hopes on understanding our system by a study of the Federalist. Party platforms, national, state, and local, campaign textbooks, campaign speeches, broadsides, cartoons, posters, and handbills, pamphlets published by partisan and nonpartisan associations, interviews in the press, articles in magazines, and a thousand other devices by which political issues are raised and public consciousness aroused, ought to be watched with close scrutiny by the teacher of government faithful to his calling. A collection of ballots should be made showing what the voter has to do on election day, and copies of instructions to voters should be filed away. A hundred other things will be suggested at once to the alert teacher, so that I need not continue the catalog, but will close the general appeal back to the sources. End of section 3section four of the history teachers magazine volume one number three november nineteen o nine this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by Greg Giordano. The History Teacher's Magazine, Volume 1, Number 3, November 1909, Section 4 Recent Revolution in Turkey. Footnote Editor's Note Dr. Haynes will contribute similar articles to forthcoming numbers of the magazine. End of footnote by john haynes ph d for years the history of turkey was a monotonous tale of domestic disorder and foreign intervention there was endless turmoil among the warring races and religions of macedonia and from time to time some dreadful outrage against the armenians of asiatic turkey the nations of europe were constantly seeking reparation for wrongs done to their citizens were urging reforms for the benefit of the sultan's christian subjects it seemed only a question of time when turkey would be blotted from the map by the powers of europe suddenly in july nineteen o eight it was announced that the constitution of eighteen seventy six which was suspended after being in force a short time had been restored only the party known as the young turks were prepared for such an occurrence for thirty years they had labored for the overthrow of the misrule of sultan abdul hamid the second their headquarters had been in paris but since nineteen o four they had been forming revolutionary organizations in turkey under a central body called the committee of union and progress the support of the movement came from the professional classes and from progressive officers in the army without whose help it could not have succeeded some days before the proclamation of the constitution the sultan learned of disaffection in the army of european turkey and vainly tried to quell it then being informed that unless he granted a constitution thirty thousand soldiers would march upon constantinople he yielded a new ministry was formed under Camille Pasha, and many of the tools of the Sultan fled the country. In many cities there were extravagant manifestations of rejoicing 
in which Muslims and Christians participated together. The Constitution of 1876 is the work of Midhat Pasha, the first Grand Vizier of Abdul Hamid. It provides for personal liberty, freedom of speech and of the press, and equality of Muslims and Christians before the law. The Parliament consists of a Senate, whose members are appointed by the Sultan, and a Chamber of Deputies, chosen by the people indirectly through electors. Under this constitution, a Parliament was chosen and opened in December by the Sultan in person. For a time all seemed to go well, but Abdul Hamid was plotting for the overthrow of the new regime, which had been forced upon him. The first sign of this was the appointment of two ministers suspected of being hostile to the progressive program. The Chamber of Deputies voted want of confidence in the ministry, and Hilmi Pasha was made Grand Vizier in accordance with the wish of the young Turks, who thus imposed a new ministry upon the sovereign, after the manner of the British House of Commons. But this did not end the matter. For months, the Sultan's money had been corrupting the army, and in April 1909, the troops in Constantinople mutinied, declaring the young Turks tyrants. Tufik Pasha, a reactionary, was put at the head of the ministry. At the same time, terrible massacres of Christians, believed to have been inspired by the Sultan, took place in Adana and vicinity. But this counter-revolution was short-lived. The Macedonian division of the army, under Shevket Pasha, soon marched upon Constantinople, took the city without serious opposition, occupied the royal palace, Yitzik Kiosk, and made the sultan a prisoner. Abdul Hamid was formally deposed by decree of the Sheikh ul Islam, the religious head of the Muslims, and the action was confirmed by the parliament. A brother, who by Turkish law was the heir apparent, was chosen in his place, and now rules as Mehmet v. Hilmi Pasha, was restored as Grand Vizier. Many participants in the counter-revolution were executed. The new sultan, who was sixty-four at his accession, has lived the secluded life of a political prisoner. The future of Turkey is almost as much a problem as it was before this remarkable revolution. The young Turks, who are now in power, stand for internal reform and the integrity of the empire. But they have to face the fact that the great majority of Muslims are reactionary, and that their power is dependent on the support of the army. The people as a whole are not fitted for self-government. One of the charges brought against Abdul Hamid was that the Turkish dominions were dismembered during his reign. But since the revolution of July 1908, Turkey has lost its nominal sovereignty over Bulgaria and Bosnia and Herzegovina. She has also been on the point of losing her small hold on Crete, though there are Christians in the parliament and two in the cabinet. The young Turks do not have the complete cooperation of the Christian population, many of whom will never be satisfied while any of Europe remains under Turkish rule. Besides, their sincerity as protectors of the Christians is doubted. The action of the court-martial on the Adana massacre is not satisfactory. Few Muslims have been severely dealt with. Scores of Christian girls, who were carried away as booty during the massacres, have not been returned to their families, nor their captors punished. The patriarch of the Armenian Catholic Church declares that the young Turks propose to make the Christians give up their educational institutions and send their children to Turkish schools. The greater part of the foreigners resident at Constantinople, while sympathetic with the new order, are not confident of the future. On the other hand, there are persons thoroughly conversant with Turkish affairs, who feel sure that a new day of freedom and progress has really dawned. The future only can tell. End of Section 4 Recording by Greg Giordano Newport Ritchie, Florida. Section 5 of The History Teacher's Magazine.
Volume 1, Number 3, November 1909. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Giordano. Section 5 The History Teacher's Magazine, Volume 1, Number 3, November 1909 proposals of the committee of eight a restatement by james alton james of northwestern university chairman of the committee teachers of history the country over have for the past ten years been grateful that the american historical association assumed that history for the secondary schools offered problems in which its members were vitally interested in all of our schools today, some effect of the revolution wrought by the report of the Committee of Seven may be observed. It was not going far afield then, when the same association, observing the heterogeneous condition existing also in the presentation of history in the elementary schools, should have proffered some assistance. At the Chicago meeting of the association, therefore, teachers of history from elementary and high school from normal schools and colleges were invited to a conference on the topics one some suggestions for a course of study in history for the elementary schools and two the preparation most desirable for the teacher of history in these schools following the discussion the resolution was adopted that it was deemed desirable that a committee should be appointed to make out a program in history for the elementary schools and consider other closely allied topics in response the committee of eight was selected to consider the problems suggested and prepare a report care was exercised in making up the committee to secure a majority who should be in actual touch with the work of the elementary schools as originally composed the committee consisted of three superintendents of schools two teachers in normal schools, and two from the colleges. It cannot be said, therefore, that the report, finally presented after four years of labor, is the result of the working out of fine-drawn theories on the part of college men. In fashioning the report, present conditions were kept steadily in mind. Looking towards some uniformity in the program for history in our elementary schools, Due praise must always be accorded to the report of the Madison Conference on History, Civil Government, and Economics, which was published in 1893, and to the supplementary report of the Committee of Seven. In these reports we find the first significant declarations that history is entitled to a place of dignity in all secondary and elementary school programs. Some 200 superintendents of schools in different parts of the country have submitted for the consideration of the committee what they believe to be the best programs and many elementary history teachers have been consulted on various features of the report opportunity for discussing the most important phases was given in a number of teachers associations in various sections of the country through these letters and discussions the committee has obtained many practical suggestions the committee has attempted to present a plan of study which would bring about concerted endeavor avoid duplication of work in the several grades and produce unity of purpose to this end our fundamental proposition is that history teaching in the elementary schools should be focused around american history by this we do not mean to imply that american history has to do with events alone which have occurred in america the object is to explain the civilization the institutions and the traditions of the america of today america cannot be understood without taking into account the history of its various peoples before they crossed the atlantic indeed too much emphasis has heretofore been laid upon the atlantic as a natural boundary not merely of the american continent but also of the history of america the grouping of the subject matter for the several grades is as follows in the first two grades 
the object is to give the child an impression of primitive life and an appreciation of public holidays to the succeeding three grades is assigned the study of great leaders and heroes world heroes in the third american explorers and leaders in america to the period of the revolution in the fourth and leaders of the national period in the fifth in addition there should be noted the manners customs and so far as possible the industries of the various sections of the country at the period under discussion the sixth grade as outlined will at first glance present the greatest difficulties with full appreciation of this tendency the committee has carefully and at greater length than for the other grades to find its position it is recommended that there should be presented to pupils of this grade those features of ancient and medieval life which explain either important elements of our civilization or which show how the movement for discovery and colonization originated a glance at the outline shows that it is not intended that the topics should be presented as organized history it goes without the saying that pupils in this grade are not prepared to study scientific history in its logical and orderly development but as stated in the report they are prepared to receive more or less definite impressions that may be conveyed to them by means of pictures descriptions and illustrative stories arranged in chronological sequence in receiving such impressions they will not understand the full meaning of the great events touched upon but they will catch something of the spirit and purpose of the greeks the romans and other types of racial life for the seventh grade it is recommended that the growth and settlement of the colonies be taken up with enough of the european background to explain events in america having their causes in england or europe here should be considered also the american revolution the subject matter of the eighth grade would include the inauguration of the new government the political industrial and social development of the united states westward expansion and a brief study of the growth of the great rival states of europe is it not beyond dispute that much of our teaching of history in the past has failed of proper results for the reason that pupils advancing from grade to grade have been compelled to consider topics with which they have grown familiar who has not noted the deadening effect on the interest of pupils especially in the history of our own country where the prescribed course found in many schools has been faithfully followed which provides a text in elementary american history for the fifth and sixth grades succeeded by a grammar school american history in the next two grades to secure continued interest it is advised that it be offered in each of the several years one distinct portion or section of our country's history that this be presented with as much fullness as possible and that the recurrence in successive years of subject matter that has once been outlined be avoided while the proper distribution of historical subject matter is the prime feature of the report the committee would emphasize the consideration of other items such as the outline presented for elementary lessons on government the training suitable for the teacher the correlation with geography and literature and the methods to be employed in offering the report we are aware that a literal interpretation of some of its phases would preclude its use in many of our schools but let it be borne in mind that no one of us has for a moment assumed that there is to be a rigid adherence to detail in the minor subdivisions of each year's work if the report as a whole appeals to teachers pointing the way to a practical solution for many of the problems now encountered then may we look with confidence for more satisfying results from our elementary history teaching and as a consequence expect more consideration for the subject itself on the part of those who control the making of school programs end of section five recording by greg giordano newport ritchie florida section six of the history teachers magazine volume one number three november nineteen o nine this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by phone the history teachers magazine volume one number three november nineteen o nine section six review of the report of the committee of eight
history in the elementary schools report to the american historical association by the committee of eight reviewed by sarah a dines head of department of history in new jersey state normal and model schools trenton new jersey the course of study in history for elementary schools mapped out in the report of the committee of eight is an attempt to secure by the aid of a national organization some uniformity in the program for history the personnel of the committee led us to expect an able report the specialist in american history the specialist in european history and the specialist in the pedagogy of history for elementary grades were all represented three superintendents of schools upon the committee seem to warrant us in anticipating that the rights of other subjects in the elementary curriculum would be guarded and that history would not be permitted to absorb an undue proportion of the pupils time the presence of those closely associated with elementary schools caused the present actual condition of such schools to be cut clearly in mind while the work proceeded practical experience gained in dealing with both the elementary teacher and the elementary pupil led them to inquire at each step whether a proposed change were possible while the experience of the specialists in american history and in european history naturally called attention to what would be desirable from the standpoint of subject matter the committee presented a preliminary report for consideration and frank discussion at three different regular meetings of the american historical association held at chicago baltimore and providence respectively a report of what had been accomplished by the committee at the close of its second year of work was presented to the department of superintendents at a regular meeting of the national educational association for nineteen o seven certain features of the report were also discussed at the regular meeting of the history teachers association of the middle states and maryland held in new york city suggested topics of the report were discussed by the chicago history teachers association and by the history teachers association of the north central states from the foregoing it is easily seen that there has been no undue haste in arriving at conclusions it will be noted also that all experienced teachers of history and all superintendents who are really interested in improving the quality of the teaching of elementary history have had abundant opportunity to contribute toward the improvement of the proposed course and to object to that which seemed visionary impracticable or unwise interest in the report has been widespread during the past three years and it is gratifying to know that it is now published in a form which makes it accessible to all interested the course includes a series of organized groups or topics for the first eight years of school life the most cursory examination of the work suggested for the primary grades brings to view these expressions one historical backgrounds two stories three pictures four construction five teachers list of books this is certainly encouraging it suggests mental pictures it emphasizes vivid impressions of concrete objective reality things are to be seen touched used in new combinations the preparation of the teacher is to be in part from books not from a book she is made to feel that elementary history must be picture making not word getting a closer examination shows that there is no repetition of subject matter as the child passes from grade to grade this last feature will be welcomed most heartily by the elementary teacher of history nothing is more gratifying than to have the entire responsibility of teaching the topics assigned to her own grade if she is a fifth grade teacher and is making her preparation for teaching a biography of daniel boone she can look back through the topics suggested by the committee to be taken up in grades four three two and one and congratulate herself that no other teacher has touched a topic it is her privilege to introduce this hero with the fullest assurance that there is no danger of trespassing upon the territory of another if at the close of the work the pupils of the fifth grade have a vivid picture of life on the border if they have been led to sympathize with the dangers the trials the hardship of frontier life and have gained an impression of the importance of daniel boone's service to his fellow men she has done a creditable piece of work if they are bewildered mystified confused and glad to leave the subject she has no one to blame but herself by noting what has been done in the four preceding grades she has reason to expect a certain amount of skill on the part of pupils in construction work the pupils have already built wigwams and that will make it easier for them to make a hunter's camp or to draw a representation of a cabin on the cattle range or of the fort at boonesboro they have had practice in interpreting pictures and in finding pictures they have had experience with sand tables and in clay modeling and in making costumes they have been reproducing stories and anecdotes and taking part in discussions consequently she can expect a vocabulary in which there is a meaning and significance attached to the words used what has been illustrated in the case of daniel boone is as true of any other topic some topics are to be taught in more than one grade but in each case the committee has carefully planned to avoid overlapping and prevent repetition 
In the fifth grade, the topics are organized into 12 groups, lettered A to L inclusive, with from three to five subtopics in a group. The following selections show the general scope of the work outlined. Group D is the Great West, and Daniel Boone is one of the subtopics to be taught in that group. Group E, the Northwest, contains the story of George Rogers Clark as one of the subtopics. Group G, increasing the size of the New Republic, contains the story of Lewis and Clark. Group L, Great Industries, contains the following stories. Cotton, the cotton fields, the factory. Wheat, the wheat fields, grain elevators. Cattle, cattle grazing, stockyards. Coal and iron, the mines, the furnaces, the products. In addition to these biographical stories selected from the field of American history, the committee suggests that 20 minutes a week for one half of the year should be devoted to the study of civics. The following are suggested topics to be discussed. The fire department, the police department, the post office system, street cleaning and sprinkling, public libraries. The committee, in a table given on page 126, shows how a place may be made on the program in each grade for the study of history. That program provides only one recitation per week in the first three grades. In the fourth and fifth grades, there would be two recitations a week. The work suggested in the report for the first five grades could be easily accomplished in the time stated in the program. The committee suggests that a textbook be placed in the hands of the pupils in grades 6, 7 and 8, but emphasizes the necessity of oral work in the first five grades. He also advised the continuation of much oral work in the sixth grade. The subject matter of the sixth grade includes such portions of European history as bear most directly on American history. The topics selected for study are organized into six groups lettered HF inclusive. Counting one recitation as the unit of measurement in estimating the relative amount of time to be devoted to each group, the committee estimates the relative importance of the groups thus. Groups F and C have 13 units each. Group E has 12. Group B has 7. Group A has 5. Group D only 3. This matter of indicating the relative importance of the groups will be of great value to the inexperienced teacher. The committee also wisely suggests what not to attempt in this grade. The greater portion of the pupil's time in the sixth grade is to be spent upon the following topics. Alfred and the English. How the English began to win their liberties. The discovery of the Western world. European rivalries which influenced conquest and colonization. In this grade also, there is to be instruction in civics for one half year, 20 minutes a week. A list of topics suggested includes the following. Water supply and sewerage system. The board of health. Juvenile courts. The program, page 126, previously referred to, provides three recitations per week in history for the sixth grade. The topic of the seventh grade are organized into six groups, all of which are connected with the exploration and settlement of North America and the growth of the colonies, to the close of the Revolutionary War. Enough of the European background to make clear the significance of certain situations in America is included. The group headings are as follows. A. The first settlements in America of the three rivals of Spain. B. Exiles for political or religious causes. C. Colonial rivalries. D. Growth of the English colonies. E. Struggle for colonial empire between England and France. F. From colonies to commonwealth. The topics in civics are those that grow naturally out of the instruction in history, such as an explanation of our search warrant in connection with a study of the writs of assistance, and in addition, topics of this character, state charities, state schools, state penal institutions, national parks, preservation of forests, construction of roads, canals, harbors. These topics in civics are to be covered in a time allowance of 40 minutes a week for the entire year. The number of recitations in history indicated in this grade is 8 to 7, of which the last group, F, has 34, and A has only 5, B has 18, C and D have 11 each, E has 8. The work for the 8th grade begins with the constitutional period of American history and closes with the problems which confront our nation today due to our rapid industrial development, commercial rivalry and our recent annexations. These topics are organized into seven main groups as follows. A. Organization of the United States B. The New Republic and Revolution in Europe C. Industrial and Social Development D. New Neighbors and New Problems E. Expansion Makes the Slavery Question Dominant F. The Crisis of the Republic G. The New Union and the Larger Europe 
the committee suggests the relative amount of time to be devoted to each subtopic in this grade ninety-four recitation periods are required to cover the work outlined nineteen of which are given to f sixteen to b fifteen to g c and d have twelve each and a and e have ten each the committee also suggests that an average of sixty minutes a week be devoted to civics in this grade and that the textbook in civics as well as a textbook in history be placed in the hands of each pupil the function of city state and national government should be emphasized rather than the machinery of each the actual work of the government today and concrete instances of civic duty should be discussed and a special study of such topics as child labor corruption in politics best methods of work in local city governments is advised fifteen pages are devoted to a discussion of the preparation of the teacher the suggestions offered are helpful and in accordance with the best educational theories the entire chapter though brief shows clearly the need of special preparation if the teacher hopes to make a success of her work the entire book is a teacher's book the outlines given are not for the classroom they are to serve as a suggestion to the teacher who will make her own outlines based upon the principles laid down in the report and dealing with the phases of subject matter which the committee selected no attempt has been made to go beyond what is already being done in the best schools of the country the committee has tried to show what is possible in elementary grades the report will doubtless tend to improve the work in the less favored sections of the country the plan of work presented is a very definite and carefully considered plan which is certainly entitled to a fair trial on its merits the study of history in the elementary schools report to the american historical association by the committee of eight new york charles Scribner's sons 1909 chapter 17 page 141 50 cents End of section 6section seven of the history teachers magazine volume one number three november nineteen o nine this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by betty b the history teachers magazine volume one number three november nineteen o nine section seven suggestions on elementary history by professor franklin l riley university of mississippi outline for oral lessons on westward immigration adapted to the third or fourth grade one the western country and how it was reached virginians and their neighbors moved oftener than the colonists to the north attracted by mineral springs salt licks and bluegrass buffalo paths converge at cumberland gap wilderness road two hundred miles long from virginia through this gap to kentucky made by daniel boone in charge of thirty men at first only a narrow path for horsemen and footmen pack saddles how made and used two daniel boone columbus of the land born in pennsylvania father settled in wilkes county north carolina when daniel was about thirteen years old early life on frontier farm used gun almost as early as hoe little log home married at twenty five years later he decided to move wanted elbow room if these people keep coming soon there will not be a bar in all this country prospecting trip across the mountains with two or three backwoodsmen at the time of the french and indian war up a tree to escape from a bear d boone sealed a bar on this tree in seventeen sixty on a beech tree in eastern tennessee three new homes in the wilderness nine years after killing the bear in tennessee he went to kentucky to find a new home wild game deer bear buffaloes wolves shelter of logs open on one side dark and bloody ground indian tricks imitating turkeys and owls killed a stump captured by indians escape after seven days alone in the wilderness five hundred miles from home forty new settlers from north carolina capture of boone's daughter and two other girls by indians and their rescue elizabeth kane and the grapevine swing boone a prisoner in detroit indians refuse five hundred dollars for him his escape removal to missouri death and burial at frankfort four a frontier home log cabin in a clearing near the fort ladder against wall for stairway and pegs in wall for clothing 
rough boards supported by four wooden pegs for dining table dirt floor five life of a pioneer boy taught to imitate notes and calls of birds and wild animals to set traps and to shoot the rifle at twelve he became a fort soldier with a porthole assigned to him taught to follow an indian trail and to conceal his own when on the warpath six suggested topics for other lessons one the story of james robertson two the story of john severe three the story of george rogers clark four stories of the french in america and the struggle for the mississippi valley seven bibliography gordy's american leaders and heroes charles scribner's sons mcmurray's pioneers of the mississippi valley and hart's source reader in american history number no. three and eggleston's stories of great americans and first book in american history a b company catherwood's heroes of the middle west and blaisdell and ball's hero stories from american history gin and company aunt charlotte's stories of american history d appleton and company methods of primary instruction one oral presentation these stories should be given by the teacher in a simple animated style adapted to the mental status of the child they should abound in narration rather than description children like action during the first two years they should be related rather than read two illustrations frequent use should be made of blackboard illustrations printed pictures objects etc should also be used three construction children should do constructive work along lines suggested by the lessons draw pictures make log houses bows arrows wigwams etc four reproduction the story should be frequently repeated by the pupil until they are thoroughly mastered they should also be reproduced in written form as soon as the child is sufficiently advanced notebooks the children should copy their stories after they have been corrected into their history notebooks neatness should be emphasized six memory work the children should memorize historical poems and brief extracts from historical literature which are thoroughly comprehensible to them seven reading the children should be encouraged to acquire new facts for themselves from books that are easily comprehensible to them eight reviews there should be frequent reviews these exercises should be varied as much as possible and should be often held at unexpected times call on different members of the class to tell of their favorite characters give characteristic incidents not already related in the life of a person and let the children guess who it is let them guess what certain pictures represent etc nine rewards the child should be occasionally rewarded with something to read about his favorite character reward the mind but do not permit it to be surfeited ten problems in the latter part of the primary course special attention should be given to historical problems see mcmurray's special method in history pages sixty six to seventy four suggestions on primary history one have the purpose and outline of the story well in hand before presenting it and let your presentation be independent of the book the outline of your story should be very carefully prepared two avoid complex details tell story vividly the educational value of these stories does not depend upon literal accuracy three the sequence of events and their relations are more important than dates a long time ago means more to a child than fourteen ninety two four lay special stress on ethical teaching cut down wars and military campaigns as much as possible five go slowly haste is a poor policy a teacher may sometimes devote weeks to a single character to advantage do not cram facts indiscriminately into children's minds six do not repeat stories to the same children from year to year seven for directions how to select stories see mcmurray's special method in history pages thirty four to forty eight for directions how to tell stories see ibid pages fifty four to fifty six nine for directions how to have stories reproduced see ibid pages fifty seven to fifty eight 
10. For discussion of the difficulties of oral instruction, see Ibid, pages 59 to 66. End of section 7. Section 8 of The History Teacher's Magazine, Volume 1, Number 3, November 1909. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by greg giordano the history teachers magazine volume one number three november nineteen o nine section eight a type lesson for the grades by armand j gerson the spanish claim a type lesson of the many complaints made by history teachers in secondary schools regarding preparation given in the grades perhaps none contains a greater amount of truth than the oft-repeated statement that while pupils leave our elementary schools with a large stock of historical terms and phrases they often lack a real grasp of their significance i know of a pupil who after a whole year of sixth grade work defined tax as Quote, money that is paid for tea end quote, and who honestly thought that george the third's ministers were quote, a sort of clergyman end quote. still more frequent are the instances where the pupils notions of terms used are so hazy and inadequate as not to admit of definition at all this condition may be variously explained the trouble is often caused by an improper use of the textbook the incompetent teacher resting content if the pupil commits the words on the pages and recites them with some semblance of intelligence in most cases however it is safe to say that the misconceptions are the result of the teacher's failure to grasp the child's difficulties his inability to put himself into the pupil's place and realize the mental equipment which the child brings to the grasping of the new ideas be the cause of the difficulty what it may the recognition of its existence must be the first step towards its removal the word claim occupies a prominent place among the disturbers of the peace in the course of the history work the children become familiar with the fact that the voyages and explorations of the spanish english french and dutch somehow give rise to quote, land claims end quote, whose overlapping results in interesting international conflicts judicious questioning however is apt to disclose a surprising lack of definiteness as to the meaning of this word claim in accordance with the type lesson method this vagueness of comprehension might readily be avoided if the claim concept were developed thoroughly in connection with the explorations of a single european nation in other words the teaching of a typical claim forms the surest sort of basis for the comprehension of land claims in general spain because of the early date of its explorations naturally suggests itself as the type let the pupil understand intensively all that we can teach him about the spanish claim how far it extended on what it was based what it meant and there will be no difficulty when we come to develop the claims of england france and holland in presenting the type lesson on the spanish claim the teacher must carefully distinguish and strongly emphasize the type elements i e those aspects of the subject which help form a clear concept or pattern chief among these type elements may be mentioned the following a clear understanding of what we mean by quote, right of discovery end quote some notion of the distance a claim may be said to extend beyond the point or coast explored a definite comprehension of what is meant when we speak of a nation owning land a mental attitude toward the rights of the original inhabitants reference to these fundamentals will have to be made repeatedly when the claims of other european nations are in their turn presented to the class but this mere reference is all that will be required 
if the type elements developed in connection with the spanish claim have been thoroughly grounded the particular incidents of the spanish story pedagogically speaking are of less fundamental significance in connection with the columbus story the class will have been brought to see that the chief political consequence of that event consisted in the extension of spanish dominion Quote, for castile and leon columbus discovered a new world End quote. contains an ethical principle immediately recognized by every boy of ten this principle contains the essence of the whole theory of discovery and exploration and should for a time at least be allowed to remain undisputed it might be well even to reinforce this theory by reference to the widely accepted principle applied by our boys and girls in their everyday life quote, finding is keeping end quote. ownership of what we find may indeed be disputed by others but the finder may at least be said to have a claim to it it is in this sense that spain had a claim to the new world but a nation's claim to newly discovered land is in many ways different from a boy's claim to a marble he has found first of all the boy has probably picked up the whole marble and put it in his pocket the spanish explorers on the other hand only caught glimpses of part of the edge of a great continent had they a good claim to the whole continent or could they only claim the parts they had found difference of opinion on this point is very possible and may give rise to profitable class discussion ignorance of the size and shape of the continent concentration of spanish interest in the south and the decree of pope alexander shall be pointed out as determining elements in the gradual defining of the spanish claim the work of each of the spanish explorers should be reviewed in this connection and the claim finally located on the map it is important in the next place that the pupils should devote some thought to the question of what we mean when we say spain owned florida mexico etc in this connection attention may well be called to the theory of government generally held in the sixteenth century the modern notion of government existing for the sake of the governed had scarcely taken form in the minds of men the nations of europe were avowedly selfish spain owned america in the sense that she could make laws for its people dispose of its territory and control its resources finally a complete notion of european claims to the new world must perforce include some reference to the rights of the natives the comparative rights of the natives and europeans is fortunately not a question upon which we are called upon to pronounce a verdict as an element in all colonizing activities it requires our attention however and it certainly affords admirable opportunity for cultivating our pupils human sympathies reference should be made to the preeminence of the spanish claim on the score of priority it is to be borne in mind that our type lesson besides forming the basis for the teaching of subsequent claims will have still greater significance when the conflict of european nations leads to the great international struggle for the new world constant reference to maps and charts and more important still the making of claim maps by the pupils themselves constitute an obvious but none the less essential means of rendering definite and permanent the results of the claim lesson a progressive map upon which the conflict of claims could be developed will be of particular value our endeavor throughout the spanish claim lesson should be to proceed as slowly and carefully as possible much of the detail presented need not be retained as such but will serve its most useful purpose by forming a setting for the salient points the aim of the type lesson is to construct a firm and sure foundation for later work End of section eight. Recording by Greg Giordano, Newport Ritchie, Florida. Section nine of the History Teachers Magazine, Volume one, number three, November nineteen o nine. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Betty B. The History Teachers Magazine, Volume 1, Number 3, 
november nineteen o nine section nine the hudson fulton celebration from the twenty fifth of september when the half moon and the claremont left their temporary berths in the kill van kill in staten island to october ninth when they reached the city of troy the people of the city and the state of new york devoted themselves with remarkable singleness of purpose to the celebration of two historical incidents of world-wide importance the discovery of the river by henry hudson in sixteen o nine and the successful completion of the first steamboat voyage up the river to albany in eighteen o seven for months before laymen and professional historians and history teachers had been busy preparing for the celebration and the result of their work was to be seen in the parades and pageants circulars instructions maps pictures and even historical treatises succeeded each other in almost endless succession of them all the pamphlet issued by the state department of education entitled hudson fulton celebration sixteen o nine to eighteen o seven to nineteen o nine and the printed circular issued by the new york city department of education entitled hudson fulton celebration suggestions for exercises are especially recommended to teachers who are looking for suggestions as to plans for similar celebrations both can be had by application to the proper authorities the parades and pageants which mark the week's celebration in new york city have been so thoroughly described in the newspapers and reviews that it would be useless to discuss them once again in this connection from the point of view of the teacher the naval parade of saturday september twenty fifth the historical parade of tuesday september twenty eighth and the school commemorative exercises of wednesday september twenty ninth and saturday october second were the most important and the most significant though none of these was perfect in all its details still all of them gave to the children of the city opportunities for visualizing conditions as they existed in the past such as no other method could have done pages and pages of description for instance could give the child no such idea of the difficulties of navigation in the fifteenth and sixteenth centuries as the brief view of the top-heavy clumsy and poorly constructed model of the half moon did more valuable still were the exercises largely in the form of dramatization in which the children of every grade from the kindergarten to the last year of the high school participated both on wednesday morning and on saturday afternoon here the work was the result of the children's own constructive imagination aided and directed by skilled teachers and historians once again as far as possible the children were allowed to relive their lives under conditions which approximated those which surrounded their predecessors during the last three centuries as to the permanent results of the celebration it may be said first that new york city and new york state are today richer than they would otherwise have been in historical monuments and commemorative tablets which are of constant educational value further both the city and the state have been stirred to an extraordinary pitch of civic pride and civic activity and in both the children have participated largely what the past has accomplished has been thoroughly emphasized what the future demands has by no means been neglected the lesson has thus been both historical and political as a model for other cities this celebration will long stand preeminent though there were many errors and many shortcomings other communities will nevertheless find in the exercises and in the pageants much to copy that was valuable though the time and energy expended were great the results were commensurate a m w end of section nine section ten of the history teachers magazine volume one number three november nineteen o nine this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox 
LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Giordano. The History Teacher's Magazine, Volume 1, Number 3, November 1909. Section 10 Editorial Policy. It is not the purpose of the editors of the magazine to espouse any particular pedagogical policy. Articles may appear in the paper which advocate new policies or radical changes of method in the school or college curriculum, but such papers express the views of the contributors only, and not necessarily of the editorial staff of the paper. Rather, it is their wish to make the paper a mirror of the best thought and practice in the profession and to this end they will welcome correspondence and contributions upon all phases of questions arising in the teaching of history let us have a frank and full discussion of the problems facing the teacher and of the best way of solving the problems not fads or hobbies but sound experience and strong pedagogical ideals the editors invite the cooperation of their readers in making the paper a quote, clearing house for ideas in the profession. End quote. Elementary School History It may be a matter of surprise that a paper devoted largely to the interest of teachers of history in secondary schools and colleges should print in one number nearly five pages of matter relating to history in elementary schools. Yet there should be no need of an apology. Were not the several parts of the American educational system so independent of one another, our secondary and college teachers of history would not pride themselves upon their ignorance of conditions in the elementary schools. Because organically, or politically, there is little correlation among the three parts of the system, each part attempts to ignore the others, rejecting suggestions concerning its own work, and grudgingly and condescendingly giving advice concerning the others. With a few notable exceptions, several of whom appear as contributors to this number of the magazine, college men in America have kept sedulously away from the problems of history teaching in the elementary school or if they have turned their gaze upon the schools, it has been to seek a market for a new elementary history textbook. Yet the elementary school needs the best thought that the nation can give to it, not the thought of elementary school men alone, but the clearness and directness and thoroughness which come so frequently with college training. It is superciliousness or inertia which leads a college instructor to say that he cannot realize the problems of the elementary school, and then to send his children to a class taught by a young girl fresh from the normal school or high school. It was not thus that the schedules for history in the Prussian or French schools were made. It is not by thus leaving the determination of policy to weaker employees that great corporations succeed and how much more valuable are our children than corporate wealth. The report of the Committee of Eight is beyond doubt the most important feature of the year in the teaching of history in America. It deserves to rank with the report of the Committee of Seven, and its influence may well be even greater. The report is remarkable for its sanity, its absence of theorizing, its understanding of the mind of the child at several ages its clearness and general helpfulness, not content with merely outlining the field of history for each grade. The committee has realized the weakness of the teacher, and has constructed a course of study for her, and has even gone so far as to advise the emphasis and amount of time to be given to each subject. Schedule makers have previously had no advice from historians upon these points. They have been left severely alone to fix their days and hours and subjects as they might think best. The report changes all this by combining the scholarly knowledge of the historian with the skill of the pedagogical student and with the worldly wisdom of the schedule maker. Of particular significance and originality is the arrangement of topics by years in such a manner that the student receives something new in each grade. 
even although all the work centers about the history of the united states yet there is no deadening repetition year after year the topics are carefully selected for each grade with a view to increasing difficulty with the advancing years of the student perhaps no one feature of the report marks a more distinct advance than this arrangement not only should the report have a strong influence upon the arrangement of the elementary history course but should also lead to a great improvement in the instruction of history not every teacher can meet the requirements set by the committee the results will be a wider adoption of the group or department system by which the teacher is given charge of one subject or of a group of allied topics such as english and history or geography and nature study such a division of labor is in accord with the tendencies of the day it is in the interest of superior work in all subjects and it means increased mental development not for the child alone but for the teacher as well the report would deserve a hearty welcome if it did no more than advance the cause of the departmental or group teacher it will do much more than this it will add dignity to the work in history it will give school administrators an ideal of work in the subject and best of all it will give the children of the nation a course in history which will be stimulating and of definite cultural value teachers of history and school administrators should unite to see that the new plan is given a fair test under the best possible circumstances high school and college teachers should join with elementary teachers in endorsing this plan for raising the standard of history teaching in america end of section ten recording by greg giordano newport ritchie florida section eleven of the history teachers magazine volume one number three november nineteen o nine this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by greg giordano the history teachers magazine volume one number three november nineteen o nine section eleven beards readings in government and politics professor beard's work reviewed by john haynes ph d dorchester high school boston massachusetts this volume is an attempt to do for the student of government what the source book does for the student of history professor beard has prepared it primarily to be used with his own american government and politics which is now in preparation but of course it can be used with any textbook on the subject the selections include materials of many kinds among them most of the federal constitution groups of clauses bearing upon the same subject being given at the beginning of the appropriate chapter parts of the constitutions of various states decisions of the federal supreme court and other courts of last resort arguments made in congress state legislatures constitutional conventions and political meetings party platforms letters laws treaties and proclamations the declaration of independence and the articles of confederation are given in full each selection is preceded by a brief introduction of a few lines which is admirable in giving a succinct statement of the main point or points of the document which follows the wide scope of the selections both as to subjects and the sources from which they are taken is a testimony to the generous amount of labor bestowed upon the preparation of the volume on the whole admirable judgment has been used in choosing the material still some things are absent which one might expect to find the case of mullock v maryland is very properly quoted at some length but the famous dartmouth college case whose consequences were very important is not cited 
the book would be improved by the addition of selections designed to illustrate judicial procedure like a charge to a jury a declaration in a civil suit or an indictment examples of different forms of ballots might well be given especially of the ballot used in oregon when laws are submitted to popular vote the selections which as far as possible are taken from the writings of men who have had practical experience in the conduct of government have the great merit of giving a view of government as it really is the seamy side is not hidden there are documents illustrating the corruption of the police the tyranny of the boss the inequities of the gerrymander senatorial courtesy corporations and politics and the unjust assessment of taxable property a great excellence of this book is its being up to date examples of this are selections from the oregon law on the election of united states senators from oklahoma's constitution from the report of the boston finance commission issued in 1909 and the report of the minnesota tax commission of the preceding year this volume which is admirably adapted to its purpose is a distinct addition to the resources of the teacher of government while the average teacher is likely to be more hampered by the entirely inadequate time allowed for the subject than by lack of good material a contribution like this of professor beard tends to dignify the subject which is all too likely to be treated as a tale to the history kite and to secure for it the place which it deserves in school courses research note readings in american government and politics by charles a beard new york the macmillan company nineteen o nine pages twenty three through six twenty four price one dollar fifty cents end of research note end of section eleven recording by greg giordano newport ritchie florida section twelve of the history teachers magazine volume one number three november nineteen o nine this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. recording by greg giordano the history teachers magazine volume one number three november nineteen o nine section twelve civics and health dr allen's work reviewed by Louis Nussbaum. Dr. Allen has presented a work which, in the directness, forcefulness, and logic of its appeal for good health as a civic duty, makes the book worthy to be considered as epoch making. To quote Dr. Allen's thought, changed conditions of social and industrial life have virtually eliminated from present day politics the inalienable rights for which our ancestors fought and died and in their stead has come the need to formulate rules which will ensure to every citizen the economic and industrial rights essential to twentieth-century happiness and just as community of interest was the incentive to attaining those political rights in the past so united action is necessary to secure health rights scarcely any phase of the question of public health is left untouched in this interesting little book from the consideration of sound teeth as a commercial asset through the discussion of a long list of preventable and removable diseases and disorders to the examination of tuberculosis as an industrial loss dr allen has made out so strong a case against the social losses due to disease that one is necessarily aroused to a new sense of public duty and it is in this very awakening of a slumbering public consciousness that the book will do its most effective work as professor william t sedgwick says in his introduction a reading of the chapter headings merely quote, will cause surprise and rejoicing end quote. the facts of the existence of the health conditions revealed in this book are not new but the immensity of these known conditions as successively enumerated here is almost astounding 
for a brief moment in reading the book one is led to feel that it is the work of an extremist or enthusiast to be discounted in effect for a certain measure of high colouring yet a careful inspection reveals the fact that everything is told in an honest and direct even if at times dogmatic way unlike the work of many pseudo reformers dr allen's book is comprehensive in its scope in that it not only reveals existing conditions but it indicates how these conditions may be remedied and tells of the efforts thus far made to apply the proper remedies after pointing out that the best index to community health is the physical welfare of school children dr allen compares the european method of doing things at school with the american method of getting things done no brief review can do justice to a work so inspiring that to be instantly effective it needs but to be read widely it is filled with material that should be particularly at the command of every teacher if not of every parent in the land its especial interest to teachers of civics lies in its analysis of the relation of public health and its consequent economic conditions to organized government and to the body social reference note civics and health by william h allen secretary bureau of municipal research with an introduction by william t sedgwick professor of biology in the massachusetts institute of technology boston ginn and company 1909 pages 11 through 4 11 end of reference note end of section 12 recording by greg giordano newport ritchie florida section 13 of the history teachers magazine volume 1 number 3 november 1909 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org Recording by Greg Giordano The History Teacher's Magazine Volume 1 Number 3 November 1909 Section 13 American History in the Secondary School Arthur Wolfson, Ph.D. Editor A Study of the Declaration of independence the declaration of independence is in every way an ideal document for study in a secondary school every student in the class is undoubtedly familiar with it he has heard it quoted in whole or in part on numberless occasions he thinks he knows all about it and yet the teacher can easily show him that it contains vast stores of ideas which up to the present time he has never even suspected no document in all american history is so easy of interpretation the language is clear and simple the phraseology is direct and unencumbered the document is divided and subdivided so that anyone who takes the trouble can easily analyze it the declaration itself is to be found in almost every school history and the sources and secondary authorities which illustrate it are easily accessible and not too difficult for the ordinary secondary school student literature first a few suggestions as to where these sources and secondary authorities may be found of primary importance is macdonald's quote, select charters illustrative of american history 1606 to 1775 second though not so good is preston's quote, documents illustrative of american history 1606 to 1863 third hart's quote, american history told by contemporaries end quote, volume two part six fourth the quote, american history leaflets end quote, 
numbers eleven nineteen twenty one and thirty three besides these the teacher may easily discover one or another of the documents in many other places of the secondary authorities beside the ordinary histories of the american nation all of which contain the leading facts and incidents upon which the declaration is based the teacher is referred especially to friedenwald's quote, declaration of independence end quote. next to that the most important works are moses coit tyler's quote, literary history of the american revolution end quote, and frothingham's quote, rise of the republic of the united states end quote, particularly the footnotes furthermore the teacher and the student will find illuminating essays on the political theories of the Declaration of Independence in Merriam's quote, American Political Theories, end quote, in A. Lawrence Lowell's quote, Essays in Government, end quote, in Leslie Stevens' quote, English Thought on the Eighteenth Century, end quote, and in Bryce's quote, Studies in History and Jurisprudence, end quote. by no means all of these works need be consulted an examination of one or two of them will suffice the study of the declaration falls naturally into three parts and students may therefore profitably be set to work separately or in groups on one of its three problems first there is the problem of the growth of the idea of independence second there is the problem of the validity and cogency of the numberless adverse criticisms of the declaration is it merely a mass of quote, glittering and sounding generalities of natural right end quote, as choate called it is it a partisan and unfair statement is its political theory false and therefore of no historical importance third there is the possibility of submitting the declaration itself to complete and thorough classroom analysis idea of independence taking each of these problems separately let us endeavor to set in order first the sources which should be studied in tracing the growth of the idea of independence in the colonies up to seventeen sixty one though there have been causes or differences of opinion between the crown and the colonies none of these causes had led to an open breach in seventeen sixty one came the difficulty about the writs of assistance in which james otis took such a prominent part otis's speech on the writs of assistance and especially his quote, vindication of the house of representatives end quote, and his quote, rights of the colonies end quote, may therefore be studied with profit in them will be found the first statement of the american theory of government these documents may be found in hart's contemporaries in the american history leaflets and in various other places following then in quick succession came the various declarations of the colonies and the various petitions to the crown beginning with the declaration of the stamp act congress issued in seventeen sixty five and ending with the olive branch petition issued in june seventeen seventy five most of these documents can be found most conveniently in macdonald's select charters and the teacher can make his own selection according to his taste and the size of his class the only thing to be emphasized in the study of any or all of these documents is the fact that as friedenwald expresses it in speaking of the first continental congress declaration of independence page twenty eight quote, spirited and not spoken as were the resolutions of the congress of seventeen seventy four and stating their demands there is no sign among them all that can be rightly interpreted as indicating a wish for the establishment even remotely of an independent government End quote. the same facts can be gleaned from a study of tyler's literary history of the american revolution volume one page four fifty eight with the news of the rejection of the olive branch petition which reached the colonies in november seventeen seventy five begins a new phase of the american revolution 
thenceforward there is a rapid and steady growth of the idea of political independence the development of this idea should be studied in such documents as the declarations of the various colonies especially the virginia declaration of rights june 1776 and in the writings of the revolutionary leaders such as thomas paine's pamphlet entitled common sense issued in january 1776 and the correspondence of john adams the idea culminates of course in the declaration of independence Quote, under this aspect says tyler volume one page 477 comparing the revolution to the civil war the american revolution had just two stages from 1764 to 1776 its champions were nullifiers without being secessionists from 1776 to 1783 they were secessionists and as events proved successful secessionists End quote. criticism of the declaration of independence began with the animated versions of john adams in his letter to pickering in 1822 and has continued ever since first it has been declared that the ideas expressed in the preamble are not new that quote, there is not an idea in it end quote, as adams said quote, what had been hackneyed in congress for two years before End quote. Second, that the document is partisan, and that the statement of grievances is unfair to the British Crown and to Parliament. Third, that the political philosophy contained in the preamble is false and contrary to the facts of history. Jefferson's reply. In a short paper like this, it is impossible to examine each of these criticisms in detail. A teacher who is interested can easily find in Friedenwald and in tyler and in the other authorities mentioned above full and adequate discussion of each of these charges here it must suffice to say in answer to the first charge that jefferson himself in a letter to madison dated august thirty eighteen twenty three declared quote, i did not consider it any part of my charge to invent new ideas altogether and to offer no sentiment which had ever been expressed before I thought it a duty to be, on that occasion, a passive auditor of the opinions of others, more impartial judges than I could be of its merits and demerits. End quote. In other words, Jefferson's task was not to invent, as French publicists were prone to do on such occasions, new theories of government, but simply to express the ideas which were the product of the political discussion which was going on about him and which would be familiar and acceptable to the men in america and in europe to whom the declaration was addressed that the document is partisan is of course true but this is scarcely a valid criticism neither jefferson nor any of his colleagues claimed to sit as judges between the colonies and the mother country they were bound merely to put their claims as strongly as they could and then leave the judgment of the case to quote, a candid world end quote. third as long as the declaration be studied merely as an historical document it matters not whether its theories be false or true it matters only that the student understand how completely its principles dominated the minds of the men who had a share in drawing up the document and the minds of men both in america and in europe to whom it was addressed the declaration analyzed coming now to the analysis of the declaration itself we find that it falls naturally into three parts first there is the preamble in which jefferson and his colleagues set forth the political theory current in the colonies in seventeen seventy six second there is the enumeration of grievances by which the colonists hoped to prove that the king had violated their sacred rights and finally there is the conclusion namely Quote, that these united colonies are and of right ought to be free and independent states End quote. the political doctrine of the declaration is well known summed up in a single phrase is commonly called the compact theory of government that is that all men are born with certain quote, natural rights End quote. 
that to secure these rights they enter by their own consent into political unions the compact that when these natural rights are violated by those whom they have set up to govern them they have a right to throw off the restraints of government to enter into a new compact quote, to provide new guards for their future security end quote. It used to be supposed that Jefferson derived this theory of government from the writings of the French philosophers, of whom Rousseau was the most famous. This idea, however, has long since been exploded. We know now that the American revolutionary statesmen, from Otis to Jefferson, were impregnated with good English ideas, that they looked to John Locke, not to Rousseau, as their master. The teacher should therefore make clear to his students just what the ideas of Locke were, and especially the occasion which gave them birth. It is not a matter of chance that Locke's treatises on government were issued in the period of the Revolution of 1688, and the student should be made to understand this. For a full discussion of the almost exact verbal relation between the Declaration of Independence and the writings of Locke, the teacher is referred to the books mentioned at the beginning of this paper. The Colonial Grievances Perhaps the most valuable class exercises in connection with the Declaration of Independence is an analysis of the grievances set forth in the document and the effort to find the specific acts upon which these statements are based. Several of them refer to acts and events whose history is obscure but most of them can easily be traced to their sources. For a thorough analysis of the grievances, the teacher should go to Frieden Vault, chapters 10 and 11. Here we can give only the briefest outline. Thus, for instance, a search of the journals of the Board of Trade will show that at least 25 important laws were rejected or suspended by the Crown in 1773, that the consideration of other laws was neglected sometimes as long as four or five years, sections one and two, that the king absolutely forbade his governors in 1767, and even earlier to allow the colonial assemblies to organize new counties in the Appalachian region unless they were willing to deprive those counties of representation, section three. The facts upon which sections four, five, and six are based may be found in almost any school history. The grievances stated in section 7 and 8 are again somewhat obscure, and cannot therefore be used with profit for classroom discussion. The next three sections, however, refer to acts and events which grew out of the attempted enforcement of the various acts of Parliament between 1765 and 1775, and which can therefore be found without difficulty. Sections 12 and 13, likewise, are based on facts which any student can discover in his textbook. The facts upon which section 14, which refers to the various acts of Parliament attempting to regulate colonial trade and colonial government, is based the student can again discover by consulting his history, while the last four grievances which complain of acts done by the King since the outbreak of the Revolution can be analyzed with the greatest facility. The conclusion of the Declaration needs no special study. It follows naturally from the preamble, and from the statement of grievances which Jefferson and his colleagues now considered as proved. The irony, conscious or unconscious, of Jefferson's use of the exact language of the Declaratory Act of 1766 always impresses the student when the comparison is made clear. MacDonald Charters, page 316. Another fruitful comparison is with the Dutch Act of Abjuration of July 24, 1581. Old South Leaflets, number 72. The student should be required to know exactly the language of the most significant phrases of the conclusion. Indeed, certain striking and important phrases throughout the Declaration may very well be set to the student's for exact memorization. End of section thirteen. Recording by Greg Giordano, Newport Ritchie, Florida.